Good evening. Welcome to Public Forum. In September 2000 at the United Nations Millennium Summit, 189 member nations came together to make the elimination of poverty and fulfillment of human rights their highest priorities. From this path-breaking agreement was born the Millennium Development Goals or MDGs. MDGs are a set of eight objectives to accelerate human development, achieve universal equality and attain a more peaceful world by 2015. We are in the year 2010, five years away from the targeted time frame. How far have we progressed? Does the talk of outstanding growth rate, gloss over inequality and the high levels of poverty? That's what we raise in today's public forum as we discuss the Millennium Development Goals. For more on this with me on the panel today, very distinguished guest, Minar Pimple, who is Regional Director for Asia and the Pacific UN Millennium Campaign. Minar Pimple is an expert in poverty reduction, governance and accountability. Thanks very much for joining us in this discussion. Thank you. Also, Ms. Nisha Agrawal, who is CEO of Oxfam India. Oxfam India is a member of Oxfam International, which works on issues related to poverty and injustice. Thanks very much, Ms. Agrawal, for coming here. Thank you. Also, Mr. Ashok Bharti, who is... Uh, chairperson of National Confederation of Dalit Organizations, also known as NACDOR, a union of more than 1,200 grassroots Dalit organizations spread all over India. Thanks very much, Mr. Bharti, for coming here. And also Dr. Santosh Mehrotra, his Director General of Institute of Applied Manpower Research Planning Commission. Thanks, Mr. Mehrotra, for coming here. So how far India has progressed in achieving these goals? Are few of these goals just too ambitious and unattainable? We discuss all this in our first segment. Coming straight to you, Mr. Pimple. What was the reason behind having Millennium Development Goals and how far has India progressed in achieving these goals? In 2010, when 189 world leaders met in New York at the General Assembly of the United Nations, they were looking for what is it that must happen in the new millennia. The millennia starting with 2001, what the world should achieve, what is the dream that we should have for more peaceful, humane and just world for all men, women, youth and children. And that is why Millennium Declaration was signed by all these important leaders, including the then Prime Minister of India. And the Millennium Declaration is a very unique document. It's a document which combines major discourses of human rights, human development, and human security. These are the three pillars on the basis of which Millennium Declaration uh, takes its source of inspiration. And from the Millennium Declaration, what was needed was to have a more concrete achievable time-bound goals and the Millennium Development Goals, the uniqueness of Millennium Development Goals, the eight goals were articulated with very precise 18 targets and you had 48 indicators which were outlined so that you could measure all the progress of all those goals. And as you rightly pointed out, this is the 10th anniversary of the Millennium Development Goals since they were signed and this year we will have a summit. Summit means all the Prime Ministers and Presidents of 192 countries now in the world will participate in New York in September to assess the progress of last 10 years and more importantly to decide what the world needs to do to achieve Millennium Development Goals be a code by correction. 2015. There will also be absolutely, code correction. absolutely. So what we as a Millennium Campaign are trying to push for is that the world leaders go to the meeting in September in New York not only with the assessment of last 10 years but also with breakthrough plans for the remain, remaining five years so that all uh, world can achieve MDGs and especially those who have been left out. Okay, I'll bring in Ms. Agrawal here. We also, uh, you're heading Oxfam India and Oxfam India is very uh, strongly, you know, involved in activities of dealing with uh, human rights issue as well as, uh, you know, poverty reduction strategies. In that scenario, if you see, we also have the 11th five-year plan and that's, uh, the, the target of achieving the 11th five-year plan uh, is uh, 2012. Uh, how far you, you see that India has progressed in achieving MDG as well as the 12th, uh, 11th five-year plan targets? Um, Oxfam works with the poorest of the poor and we work through our partners who work at the grassroots level. From where we sit, we feel that while on paper some of these targets might be met in India, they're not really going to reach the really poor that we are concerned about. We're living in an India today which is really not one country. There are the haves and the have-nots. It's really two Indias. And our whole strategy is about how we bring those two together. So we have one half of the country where children are going to school, they can expect to live beyond five years old, mothers don't need to die when they're giving birth to their children. And there's another half which, you know, is divided by state, by groups of people that is really getting left behind. So MDG is at an aggregate level, yes, but really are they reaching the bottom 20% of India? We don't think so. 
That is the reality that we see every day in our world. And we also see the problem in India is also because you're not just fight, fighting the problem of deprivation, but also social norms, disparities, and something which is very, uh, you know, integral to our caste dynamics, the, the very heterogeneous nature of our society, which makes things all the more difficult. Yeah, I think this is what is so unique about India in a way, that our society is really fragmented along many lines. So, yes, you, call, you can say poor, but what, what do, who do they consist of? They consist of women, because the gender gaps are really huge in this country on any dimension, whether it's power or voice or income or participation in public life. You look at Dalits as a group, so the fragmentation along caste lines, which I'm sure my colleague will talk about much more. And you look at uh, tribal people versus non-tribal. I mean, we are looking at it all today together. But the differences are so vast, you don't recognize. So who do you call you know? for? This is in fact and then in the country. fourth group, very importantly, that we even don't talk about very openly, the Muslims versus the non-Muslims. On any set of indicators, these groups are living in a completely different India, actually. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bharti, this is happening in a country when we don't even know that how many people actually come under the below poverty line. We don't have straight figures. We have different committee reports coming in, but still, uh, you, everything looks very vague. Uh, you, are, you are working with a grassroots organization. What kind of response you have received on Millennium Development Goals? Let me, you know, that the, uh, as such, the people are not much aware of the Millennium Development goals because uh, I guess the the paradigm that India government, India, government of India has adopted, they are not talking about the MDGs. In fact, the India decided on NDGs, National Development Goal, which are much more ambitious than what uh, Millennium Development Goal promise. And uh, let me share that the grassroots level, the situation is not very good. Recently, we have been know that uh, media is reporting very well that how severe the problem of the undernutrition is. In fact, uh, you know, the the children of the Dalits and children of the Adivasis, more than 50% of them are undernourished. And, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that the government is trying, but uh, the uh, work is much more needed than what it, it is now. So grassroots, uh, the work is not as, uh, you know, as promising as we would like uh, it to happen. Uh, Mr. Mehrotra, you are working with the government, you're involved with the Planning Commission. How do these policies actually are framed and how, how uh, you know, when it comes to the ground level reality, things are completely different? Well, there are macro fig figures which are fairly clear, which are sort of showing that for most of the goals we will be able to achieve them. We will probably not achieve them for, th for, for gender, for sanitation, for malnutrition. And I agree with the previous speakers that there is a regional dimension and there is a, a, a social groups dimension who are the, the, the marginalized social groups who are, who are excluded. Um, but the fact remains that in the 11th five-year plan, we've made massive increases in allocations for health, for education, for agriculture, and these are the various, these are precisely the sectors which are actually uh, pushing us in the direction of inclusiveness in the growth process. I agree that, you know, the growth process has so far not been very inclusive, but the, just the fact that we've had such a phenomenal growth has generated significant revenues for the government, which has which have been ploughed back essentially into health and education. I see your point here. You're saying that the allocations have gone up, the social sector schemes, uh, the number of schemes we are running. But what is also surprising is that the irony of the whole situation, that what you're not seeing is that most of these funds are also going underutilized. Well, that's not strictly true. Uh, it's, there, are, there is underutilization of funds, but, you know, at least, for instance, in education, we know that 75% of the funds that are actually allocated are, are utilized. Now, the, the real problem is that the, the, the poorer utilization or the poorer ab absorption of government funds, centrally gov central allocations, is worse in the states which need it most, in other words, the backward states. And, it's, and those are states which have, higher, you know, have a higher incidence of poverty, they are not growing as fast, they have more dropout rates, they have lower enrollment rates, they are backward in every, di in every dimension. So basically the thing is that if we achieve the goals in, in about seven or odd states in the north and east of the country, then I think India is going really to... solve the larger problem then. No, it, no, no, we can actually, if we, if we can solve the larger problem. If we achieve it in the seven or eight states, we will achieve them in, all, in, no. in the entire country. Okay, like uh, what we were earlier also talking about, the, the response of these uh, MDGs when, it, when you talk about states like Kerala and the response in states like Bihar and uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, Mr. Karol, you'd like to respond on that. The aggregate nature, the way we are actually saying that how these MDGs are performing. I think if you look at our statistics today, there's no doubt that some states are not performing well. You know, and we've known about these so-called Bimaru states for a long time. 
it's Bihar, it's Jharkhand, it's Uttarakhand, it's Chhattisgarh, it's uh, UP, and so on. And that is where you really don't see this kind of progress because, again, we need to focus on the bottom 25%. I mean, while, yes, it's true that at the macro level, we are talking about inclusive growth, growth it's still at a talk level. Even in the 11th five-year plan, I mean, I lived and worked in Vietnam. Vietnam, in one year, is able to pull 4% of its population out of poverty. We are still at 1% a year. And we have many more, you know, we have 40% of the people below the poverty line, and we are doing it so gradually. So is it going to be 2050? 